This is a moment replete with moral opportunity at a large and personal and institutional and structural levels. I don't think people of Christian faith have all the answers, but we do bring a tradition that has thought deeply around, like in whole ways around health and what it means to belong to a society and pluralism and all these things. And c- could we maybe create a space that suddenly invites and creates some intention around harnessing that imagination before the large unknowns of this moment? And what can we learn from the past? What's being revealed in the present? And is there anything we could try to start reimagining across the various sectors of our public life, common life? Hi, friends. I'm Amy Julia Becker, and this is Love is Stronger Than Fear, a podcast about pursuing hope and healing in the midst of personal pain and social division. Speaking of healing, and before I get to today's guest, I do want to let all of you know that my next book, which is all about the topic of personal and social healing, uh, comes out on March 15th. It is called To Be Made Well, and right now we are putting together a launch team, and this is designed for people who want to read an early copy of the book and get to discuss it with one another and with me, and who are willing to help promote the book and share it with friends when it comes out. So this launch team is starting pretty much now, and I would love for you to join us. If you are interested in being a part of this discussion and then part of this Uh, effort to get people in the world to know about this book, please check the show notes um, so you can sign up to participate. You can also look on my social media or website if you want to know more about all of that. All right, but to today's show, it was so fun. I got to talk with Anne Snyder about her work. Anne is the editor for Comment Magazine and also an editor of a new book anthology called Breaking Ground. And this book came from a website. You'll hear all about how that happened. And it's an anthology that includes essays and conversations uh, with people like N.T. Wright and Marilyn Robinson, Dante Stewart, Michael Ware, a host of other voices. I happen to have one essay in this collection. I'm really, um, really honored to be among such great other voices and to be a part of this conversation. We also are giving away a copy of this book. So check out the show notes to see how you can enter to win it. And before we get into this conversation, I'll just give you a little taste of it. We're going to be talking about the past two years, kind of looking back on COVID and the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and where we find ourselves now. We also talk about a new vocabulary word, a word that I learned from reading this book. Have you ever heard the word pusillanimity? I still have to like sound out each vowel and consonant in order to say it. Pusillanimity. So bonus points for you if you already know what that means. Um, But if you don't, you are in for a treat because you're going to find out um, as Anne and I get a chance to talk about all these things today. I am here today with Anne Snyder. She is the editor of Comment Magazine and also the editor, along with Susanna Black, of a new anthology that's called Breaking Ground. And we're going to hear all about that in just a minute. But I first just want to say thank you, Anne, for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I want to start by going back to the winter of 2020, which is a time that pretty much anyone in the world can probably think back to two years ago from where we're, when we're talking. And around that time, we were starting to hear that there was a new coronavirus, not that we necessarily even had the word coronavirus in our vocabulary at the time, but a new coronavirus that had been detected in China. And I'm just wondering if you remember what the type what types of things you were working on and thinking about at that time and whether you were paying particular attention to the news about this virus oh what a great question so like literally 2 years ago which would have still been january 2020 mm-hmm. i was 4 or 5 months into this brand new role editing comment magazine i was loving it it felt both imaginative, ambitious, but also manageable. I had a great little cozy team. We were, you know, we're a magazine that goes deep into like eight miles underwater, trying to locate various (laughs) undercurrents, pre-political undercurrents of our common life. And that all felt just like perfectly paced. I loved not being hooked to the news cycle. Um, And so I do remember following the virus and for about a month, uh, yeah, between January and the end of February, I was just like, everyone else, if I, as it was becoming clear, it was not just going to stay on the other side of the world and it was going to come our way. I just sort of thought about it in personal terms. How is this going to affect our sort of 
uh, village life, our neighborly. It was just about, I didn't think about it really work-wise or in my case, like how could this potentially be a remaking time for our entire society, which therefore incurs some responsibility in what I do for a living. Um, so I think at the time, you know, I was largely, I was taking this magazine um, and trying to widen the sort of table for lack of a better metaphor of voices that were contributing. Um, I had this like deep sense of desire to incorporate what I call kind of the new America of Christianity. So I wanted people from immigrant churches and certainly the black church and um, just try to try to uh, both diversify and showcase um, a much more kind of hopeful yet also kind of long suffering wisdom that I felt wasn't being captured by, um, I mean, God bless Tim Keller, but wasn't being captured by a certain kind of uh, largely white reformed and Catholic um, writerly base, which had been kind of comments home base for the most part. So that was like where my headspace was at. And then the pandemic came and the rest is history. <laughs> All right. Yes. So, okay. So now we've made it to maybe March of 2020. And uh, that at least for me was a big shock to the system. I'm not, was not well-versed in how uh, epidemiology or pandemics operate. And so the world seemed to shut down. And yeah. then a few months later, right, in June, um, a project called Breaking Ground was born out of both Comment and a number of other publications. So I'm just wondering if you can help us um, understand what happened, what is this project, what prompted you to create it, what were your initial hopes for it? Like, just tell us about how we went from wh what you just said, like personal <laughs> concern about this virus to um, I'm starting this whole new endeavor. Yeah. I don't fully understand it myself, so I'll say that, and that remains a little bit true. I think, um, I don't know, maybe every mother can identify with that. You're like, what did I create? <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's 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 very uh, mysterious. I'm not naturally entrepreneurial uh, by disposition. Uh, I was just driving home. Uh, I just vividly remember I was in the car. One day it was sort of late March 2020. I think the the uh, uh, Tom Hanks had gotten diagnosed. There was like I think it was March 16th or 17th. That. There was like three things that occurred and everything shut down. And so it was like the week that week. Um, and I was just listening to news about the virus um, and all the economic effects and like all sort of like the headspace twirling forward, fast forwarding like dominoes. Um, and I just had this very unnerving, but indisputable sense of moral responsibility just kind of pricked my conscience and focused mm -hmm. the brain. And I just knew somehow I was, you know, I had led some things before, but comment at that point felt like the largest leadership responsibility I'd had in terms of both just a team of people, but also some intellectual leadership publicly. Um, and I just felt this unnerving sense, like I can't just continue leading this quarterly magazine um, as normal, something more urgent, something bigger and more invitational needed to be, um, put out there. Mm. And I didn't know what this would be. I just knew I needed it to be at once more focused. Like, like I was saying, we do, you know, our, we had just released an issue on tribalism. Um, the issue before that was sort of looking at this battle between love and fear and how that plays out. So we, and we were, I think we were doing like fairly, resonant subjects for anyone concerned about the U.S., concerned about North American society, what it is to be a citizen, what our common life. Um, but it felt too slow and it felt almost too uh, detached from what suddenly felt like a very volatile new reality. So I just was like, what? I think I need to do something that's more agile and time sensitive that draws from wider pools and more diverse pools of wisdom and perspective and skill sets and even cognitions than comment as its own little magazine ha had access to. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought maybe something collaborative needs to happen here. And so around the same time, um, literally like the same week, I started to get phone calls and emails from friends of mine, other editors who were losing their jobs. I was hearing from nonprofits that I loved and admired who were feeling buffeted by the threat of lockdowns and what was sort of being deemed essential and non-essential. Mm -hmm. um, and in conversations with several of these organizations, and then I, I kind of talked back to my uh, very generous colleagues that comment is published by a 
a think tank in Canada called Curtis. And as we were talking this through and I was like, can we rescue some of these people? Like, not that we're going to survive either. We're also a little nonprofit, but could we band together maybe Mm -hmm. and withstand the impending doom and gloom by linking arms and facing outward? So we just had this idea. Could we create, let's create something in this case, as Christians who sort of know a God who both strips and delivers. Um, And I had had this, you know, maybe providentially two months prior in January of 2020, this like amazing, actually it was like a Bible study retreat with a a rabbi Hmm. who kind of took me through the book of Exodus in a way I'd never understood it before. And one of the motifs in that weekend was this relationship between sort of this terrible relationship between mass death in the biblical story and God's delivering life. And you see that throughout the Old Testament. You, of course, see that in the genocide that proceed, that sort of happens when Christ is born. And, so, and something about that, which I found so horrifying, but also so hypnotizing, and somehow I couldn't ignore the pattern, was just in my head. And I was like, I think, I don't know if this is a World War II moment in the world or the Great Depression or whatever, but I think something, some major things are being revealed about our society. Um, and at the time, this is just the pandemic. This is not all the other things yet that had occurred in 2020. Yeah. Um, I think we need to create an intentional space that is um, not a hot news take, but is harnessing, that is both testing the agility of the church in all of its frac- own fracture to be agile um, before mass suffering. And could could the church be more agile than, say, the media or some political authorities or even before scholars and serve? Um, and could we provide some sort of a venue that would help help said that agility? Um, and I just was also just hoping, you know, this is a, a moment replete with moral opportunity at a large and some intimate, both personal and institutional and structural levels. Um, I don't think people of Christian faith have all the answers, but we do bring a tradition that has thought deeply around whole, like in whole ways around health and what it means to belong to a society and pluralism and all these things. Um, and c- could we maybe in create a space that suddenly invites and creates some intention around harnessing that imagination before the large um, unknowns of this moment? And what can we learn from the past? What's being revealed in the present? And and um, is there anything we could try to start reimagining across the various sectors of our um, public life, common life? Well, and so that over the course of, I guess, a couple of months came together into what was a website, as well as a series of essentially kind of curated conversations, a podcast, um, and now an anthology, right? A book that has come out um, where selected essays from the course of one year, am I correct about that? All have come together yes. to kind of, I don't know if it's, do you think of them as representative of, or like like the selection process, what? For the, that got into the book? Yeah. Yeah, it was not easy. Um, I, I, in fact, I should probably figure out what percentage we put into the book. There was a lot more content we produced, as you said, on a podcast, through essays, through virtual events. We developed something called a sermonizer, which is sort of a cheeky way of harnessing sermons from the past and present from the Black Church and the Catholic Church and Anabaptist and Reformed traditions that felt socially consequential. Um, and so there was just a lot of content wow. um, that was original to Breaking Ground, and we had you know, we were drawing from existing networks of writers that our little cobbled together team knew, but um, yeah, the book wound up, there was an element of what were our most sort of uh, conversation stirring essays that Mm -hmm. when they were published in real time, just really got out there and provoked and seemed to help um, people's own reflection in real time. And then we wanted to try to cover as wide an array of topics. So race and health and the suddenly renewed front and center role of our own households as we were all stuck at home, obviously political authority. And what does that mean in a time of unrest? Um, you know, we had an election going on. So we tried to sort of, it was chronological. We needed like, I think eight or so essays that represented each season. We divided the year into four seasons and we kind of take the reader in the book. Hopefully readers may have a little, they're and they probably, we all have COVID fatigue, but may have a little bit more hunger to reflect backwards on this very recent history and look at it in a deeper way that is, you know, uh, um, like morally alive and yet also personally provoking. And we, and so there's an element of just 
almost taking people through a diary of the year with as diverse a cross section of subjects that seem to arise in our very news cycle as possible. Yeah. And it's interesting because I read some of these essays, many of them along the way, because I was aware of breaking ground and contributing in a few cases to it. But also um, it was really interesting to get the book as a whole and actually helpful, um, even though we're still in the midst of this pandemic, but to do some of that reflecting work and to recognize all the different questions that were brought more into focus and more into the center, perhaps. And they it's not that those questions didn't exist before a pandemic. They were all there, but they were, uh, we were able to perhaps um, pay attention to them or feel the urgency of trying to at least come at some answers or see what answers have been brought up in the past. And um, yeah, I, I wondered whether in looking back at the book, it would feel kind of like reading a diary of like something that happened a while ago and or if it was still going to be thought provoking and relevant right now and it felt very thought provoking and relevant right now as I um oh, read good. It. yeah yeah <laughs> that absolutely. was my hope <laughs> absolutely no I think it's really it's a really important collection and um and also really readable too I mean the, you, these are right. these are good essays um I wanted before I ask you more about the content in there I'm curious about the title breaking ground because uh, there's like a hopeful to that. And then there's also a, um, I don't know, anything that's broken, right? There's like a sense of uh, this is, there's something hard or harsh, harsh might not be the right word, but there's still something like disruptive. There we go. Um, Disruptive and hopeful in the idea of breaking ground. So I'm just curious where the title came from. Yeah, well, I, I'll have to give full credit here. Um, So one of the magazines that like us was sort of um, like a comment in the beginning of COVID was uh, worried looking at all that was occurring and the various shutdowns was um, our sort of frenemy publication that we view them as like a friendly <laughs> competitor, um, Plow Quarterly. And um, they come from the Anabaptist tradition. They're grounded in this beautiful kind of beloved Sermon on the Mount yeah. community called the Bruderhof, which is global, but has various locations in New York state. And uh, their editor, Peter Momsen and I were talking um about about doing something together along these lines and sort of saving one another in a sense you can say um and he said you know well plow is thinking about commissioning a short series called like breaking ground for a renewed world and um we were fleshing it out and i was like that's and it was very appropriate for plow because they uh right. for reasons that are real in their own communal life they love agrarian metaphors as their own title suggests um comment is more sort of civil society institution focused uh yeah. we don't deal with shovels and dirt as well although we would love to have our own garden for our interns but anyways so so we i grabbed onto that and then i was like could we just called this whole project breaking ground and and so so he gave me the initial idea um i ran with it and you know it's um it could obviously as these things go i don't know if it's providence or or the mystery of words but it's meant it's wound up being so appropriately named and it's um i think meant different things at different moments so Yes, there is an element of if this if we are in some sort of major in between liminal juncture, like civilizationally, both in our own section of the world, but globally, that this could be one of those inflection points that we'll see in 100 years. Okay, major, you know, if if nothing else, it was an accelerant, as you said, of of soft, mostly worrisome trends, or at least unnerving trends that had developed um, the last the previous decade, decades. Um, and so there's an element of just trying to clear the ground, like how can we clear the space to get to some common vision of reality? Um, there was, and this is where I view both thus far breaking grounds efforts, frankly, as a bit of a failure. Uh, but I think it maybe I was unrealistic in hoping for this. And that was, we had sort of three, I had, I began the platform with three questions for all of our writers. And like I said, one was like, what can we learn from the past? And specifically how the church has or has not harnessed a major moral opportunity incurred by a plague or a time of widespread crisis, what is being revealed in the present? Those two questions, I think breaking ground as a platform covered up the wazoo. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of what we did. But the third question was like, what can we reimagine in our institutions and in our structures and in the nature of justice and, uh, and what is peace and that sort of more tangible, concrete, entrepreneurial, frankly, 
reimagining, I think was just too difficult. It was like a pale, it was beyond the pale or it was a bridge too far for most people just trying to survive and hunker down their various circumstances, but that the reimagining bit is, and so, and we can talk more about what breaking ground looks like after the book, but um, that is at the heart. When I get excited about this phrase breaking ground, it is, it is a sense of this is a place to dialogue and debate together what needs to be reimagined in our whole society and in the various sectors where our institutions are located and um, our parenting, you know, so many different realms. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. And then there's, yeah, yeah. Way, and, the last, and then, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, cause the title for me, I was thinking about the agrarian piece of it. Um, and you can think about growth and organic gardens and all these things, but also you break ground for a new building. Like there's yeah. an architectural, um, structural yeah, like use of breaking ground, which also I think is pertinent to so many of the topics and essays and thinking that is represented in terms of what does it mean to build something new, not just to grow something new, but also to build something new and to con- plan it and construct it and then go and like break the ground to make it happen. So anyway, that's, I love least, that. That resonates yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I lo- yeah. That, that's very resonant. Yeah. All right. Well, so I want to also ask about um, this, um, uh, conflation like these two concurrent realities that we've all experienced and you've referenced here but there's a pandemic sweeping the globe and then in essentially the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's death what came to be called a racial reckoning at least in the um, um, across America and both of those were certainly covered um in depth, I would say, through the work of Breaking Ground. And I'm curious just um, if that George Floyd's death changed the work, uh, because I know things started kind of right after that, if there was, if that was actually a, a transformative moment, but also like how are these things, a pandemic and a racial reckoning, like related to one another? Um, how do you see them interacting with one another? Yeah, that's a big question. Um so the first event that breaking ground, so to launch the entire platform, I facilitated a virtual event. This is back when we were all doing too many webinars, but yeah. this was the way we were trying to launch a brand new brand, a brand new platform and introduce it to the world. And it happened June 4th. Um, so it was hours after the very first memorial service was held for George Floyd. And um, it kind of depends who you ask. So from my vantage point, I knew before, I don't mean this in an overly prescient way, but I think it's just sort of my own, like I was saying earlier, what I was trying to do with Comet and my own little personal vocational yeah. drumbeat and mission and um, just desire rooted out of my own life experiences. I had a funny sense that something about this pandemic was going, was going to reveal ongoing realities of inequality and injustice and so on. So we were not going to be, able, you know, this, we were going to have to represent the pain of all people and the the different hopes of all people. And therefore you're going to, you're going to get into um, different ways of telling our own history as a nation. And so I, that I already sensed that would be part of the project. I wouldn't say actually some of the other folks on the team sensed that. And when we, we had a bunch of institutional partners sign up because they wanted to take part in this, or at least be affiliated with this sort of act of public moral responsibility and imagination. And several of them, um, I think we're, you know, they, they, it was, be, it was the beginnings of what well, was, it was continuing what had already been occurring for years, which is like suspicion around like, are you too woke or where are you actually fall on the, you know, where, what's your ideological lens? And I think maybe some people thought I was too woke. Right. So there was like that very first event I, I had, um, I facilitated a conversation. It was very un- unusual concoction of people, an amazing Aristotelian philosopher, white woman from U Chicago named Candace Vogler, Dante Stewart, who's now got out with maybe a New York Times bestseller. I don't know if it's that yet, but a- yeah, yeah. I actually got a chance to interview him. I don't know, a couple months ago. So yes. Uh, okay. And so he was in the- who he is. Yeah. He, he's just an amazing up and coming writer. Um, and I encourage everyone to follow his work. Um, and then Pancho Ruelas, who's a friend of mine, but sort of a real leader nationally in community organizing. And he works with undocumented immigrants who have been paralyzed. So he's really on the ground every single day, like helping people with catheters and diapers and their wheelchairs. Um, so 
something about the three of them, because each in their own way have, they've all personally suffered deep trauma and they've walked alongside those who've suffered deep trauma. I just had this instinct. They needed to kick off the core questions. This entire platform was asking, I, and I invited them before George Floyd was killed. So then that happened. And I'll just, so I say that to say, um, Obviously, and and I won't, it frankly, wasn't the easiest to shepherd this platform, which some people thought should only cover the pandemic um, to say, no, like there are all these other things that are now out in the open and to ignore them, in my opinion, is A, unchristian, B, um, it, sort of like not actually understanding the pandemic right. properly. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to be the most eloquent on on showcasing the relationship between the horror that was, of course, George Floyd's death, but of course, the horror that is the hundreds of that exact death all the time in our country with the broader sort of at the at the time COVID was sort of viewed as, you know, this is June 2020. I'm trying to remember we hadn't quite yet entered into, I don't think, fierce debates around masks yet or right. Right. um but it was it was the beginnings of all of this turmoil around um, who is really human, who in this case, who is really American? Um, what is solidarity? What does solidarity require? Mm-hmm. What does it look like when you have to be socially distanced? And in a weird way, I, insofar as like my headspace and certainly heart space, like many people's was completely absorbed by what had happened after George Floyd and this whole new focus of our attention yeah. was like a major American moment. In a weird way, the pandemic both in the social distancing at the time and no one was vaccinated or anything, there was like this opportunity for, I think, more sustained moral reflection because it was like a monastic excuse. And um, just the paradoxes of like realizing because of supply chains, like realizing how interdependent we all are with each other in our world, that those notions like, seem I thought would be this like amazing um for lack of a better word like um <laughs> like the weird word but like a moral lubricant for the like it was going to help us right. really um wrestle with this with integrity and come to new categories and new ally like new alliances yeah. that was all turns out very idealistic <laughs> um but I think at the time in the beginning I was overwhelmed. I mean, I felt when George Floyd was killed, I was like, oh my goodness, breaking ground's going to have to address this in a way that I am not equipped to uh, facilitate per se. Um, but we just have to, we have to follow our nose and try to be as responsive as we can. And I think I, I, over time, we did the best that we could. Obviously, questions about the police came into play and January 6th then occurred. So, you know, there, there were, um, I feel like there's sort of a, I hope people find in the anthology that there really is a diversity of, of viewpoints. Um, But we are trying to somehow, and I don't, it was difficult to do this virtually create like a safe space for people to air complex truths in public in a time when all we are living, you know, all we have are caricatured truths caricatured narratives and just so much like every single person is perceived as guilty before innocent. Mm -hmm. Um, So how to sort of deal with trying to lay out a common vision of reality when we're kind of so afraid of one another. um, It just was, it was like a powerful time to be a writer, I think for our writers and a very just raw time, which makes, you know, which makes for (laughs) an oasis in a weird way. I mean, there's all these paradoxes that I think helped make it pop. Um, well, and, and I couldn't I think, have predicted any of that. Yeah, part of what struck me in looking back over these essays again is the number of times that um, there's some sort of dichotomy that's presented. Like, you know, he, these are kind of the two options that our society is giving us, like the two sides or the two polarized <laughs> opposing possibilities. And here's a third way. Um, or here's at least a set of ideas that don't conform to either one of those um, polarized sides. And I think trying to create a space that is neither, you know, uh, progressive nor conservative, neither or both of those things in different ways. But, you know, and um, 
trying to create a space where maybe we could have find things in common even when we disagree. Maybe there is a sense of what it means to have a common good. Maybe the individual and the collective are not needing to be pitted against each other. You know, those types of um, at least questions and explorations in various different venues. I just was noticing that as I was looking back through all these essays that there really was a sense of trying to look for another way through rather than our divided um, polls that, you know, seem to be continuing, but nevertheless, like trying to create a different space. That's very honoring of you. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. And I'm glad that's what you're picking up. And, And the only other thing I would add to that is the texture of it, humanly speaking, is um, we really tried to seek writers who are willing to wrestle out loud and obviously like not have mm-hmm. all the answers. And yeah. there was such a humbling. I think we there. Yeah. I, I, this phrase keeps coming to me these days. Like maybe our audience is this very small chastened remnant. And I mean that both in a theological sense, but also just dispositionally out in the broader culture, faith or non-faith, secular, whatever. Um, and I think, I hope that we're saying something substantive in the compilation of all these reflections, but people really are wondering aloud as their world is being remade around them out loud. Um, And you need to provide like a patient safe space for that to occur. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you talk about the humbling and the chastening, and um, this is bringing me to Susanna Black's final essay in um, this collection, which I will start by saying I learned a new word, which I'm not sure I even know how to pronounce. Pusillanimity? Is that how you say it? Yes. Yes. Okay. She's our like classical virtues scholar on staff. So she introduced <laughs> me to more syllables than I knew I could say. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> so for anyone who might, like me, not know what this word is, pusillanimity, this is quoting her, is thinking oneself less able with less authority than one in fact has. And she actually contrasts pusillanimity to humility, saying they're not the same thing, um, and that it's a problem to think that we aren't as able or authoritative as we actually are. So I just, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this pusillanimity as a problem, but also like how we can overcome that. Like what's, how do we address that um, personally and and maybe collectively as well? Oh, what a big what a million dollar question. Um, I loved that final essay by Susanna. I still love it. I just think she has a unique way of writing with like very resonant passion and she like gets your own passions like raised as a reader. Um, part of why she and I worked, we're such different people. And we, we kind of fought a lot in a healthy way, like as editors about mm-hmm. who should be our, who should be our, who should be the prophets we should be listening to um, who sh- in this time, like who are the, who are the right muses? Who's, and I think that just somehow it wound up the friction between us intellectually, politically. Um, I'm just grateful for it in retrospect. It wasn't always easy. And I think she would agree, but so I, I think what bound us together ultimately was what she, what you just drew, drew out, which was this frustration with, with this widespread sense of helplessness. Mm-hmm. And she's, I think in that essay, specifically speaking to Christians who, who have this weird, like her just taking on the victimization trends of the broader public culture um, mm-hmm. as like the moral baton to wield. Um, and, you know, I think we both, we're bonded by just this deep sense of no, we're to be a human being. And what we want to encourage here, and this is where we stumbled upon this tradition of Christian humanism, but like what we want to encourage is the full flowering of every person's agency. Like we all, we don't feel it. I mean, your friend Andy Crouch talks a lot about this, but none of us feels we have power (laughs) where it's not even popular to own that we sort of have some sort of power, but um, at some level, we all have a relationship we can influence for good. And we all have a, um, obviously we have civic duties and we have, uh, people who are suffering in our midst, whether we allow our conscience and our sort of like heart to be pricked by it or not. Uh, so there was just a desire without being preachy to, um, touch people in such a way that they would be moved to find small ways to respond to pain, to, be humble before a narrative that you never knew would be your neighbors uh, and you're kind of horrified by it. And yet you, therefore it, therefore it calls something from you. So I don't, I call your question a million dollar question because I'm not sure I have an answer right away as to 
how to overcome this, this Mm -hmm. conscious felt sense of lost authority. But I do think something um, you begin to overcome it in conversation with those who are different from you, typically in in a very hospitable space. This could be like, hopefully a space like breaking ground, but more ideally around a physical table with meals. Um, and it begins like very small in this like dialogue and a, an encounter between strangers who can become friends. And I think there's something in that that winds up like really empowering someone to suddenly feel like, wait a second, I'm an agent in this crazy time we're living through. And there is a good I can seek and there's a good, there's a good I can help shape with all with those of goodwill. Yeah, and I think about um, just the degree to which uh, our local engagement is seems so small um, and yet is I- incredibly powerful. And I think yeah. of some of the people who you've interviewed. I think of the um, – there's one in – some of these I'm thinking of podcast episodes that you've done, but there's one interview in the book um, with the Lead for America people Right. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Because I just think it speaks a little bit to that sense of like, it might feel small and it's very local and you'll never have heard about this. And yet this is what is ultimately like, don't neglect to understand the agency that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Lead for America has been such a joy to um, get to know and walk alongside the last, I would say, five years. They are a new organization. They uh, they kind of, I guess there's like association of organizations whose last two words are for America. So they say they like have a club called like Teach for America, Lead right. for America. So it's funny. Um, but they are um, a startup. They're started by a like four 22, 23 year olds who are probably now a little older than that. Um, but the, the aim is basically they were noticing predominantly in rural places, but also mm-hmm. sort of Rust Belt towns and small cities that there was this massive brain drain going on. And everyone who mm-hmm. went off to college to get a BA uh, wasn't coming back. And most of these places have a narrative of success that is equated with leave and go very far away and make it you know, maybe send some money back home or whatever. Yeah. They were like, something's wrong here on so many levels. Like this is what's causing more soci- sort of socioeconomic division class. You know, everything seems to be, all of our debates seem to be aligning along class lines again and rural mm. versus urban. And one way that we might um, reframe your average Harvard graduate or Penn or, um, University of Michigan or UVA or, you know, yeah. degrees, these like their own narratives of success is not necessarily that you have to go off to McKinsey or the White House or these very right. elite or Silicon Valley, but what would it look like to actually reinvest in your place? And I think for a generation that feels, I mean, I know my generation is often defined by we wanted to save the world and we were running away from institutions, especially mm-hmm. the institutions that had shaped us, the one beneath me, and this is like that Gen Z, um, I think are like famously sort of rootless. So this is an organization that's trying to that get basically gives college grads a fellowship to return to their hometown and serve in local government for a few years, hoping that the relationships then built in that sense, that sort of experience leads to um, kind of long-term investment in that place. And there will be this revitalization in a way that has more integrity and more trust from the beginning relationally, because these people actually come are going back to where they came from. So, and there's support to make that, they're not even trying to make it sexy per se, this Lead for America, but they're trying to start a new movement that's harnessing localism and that's saying like when the rubber meets the road in friendships, it meets the road. It, like community doesn't exist outside of a place. They're right. trying to recapture some like almost ancient and old fashioned. Well, and um, this might be a brave and ambitious decision, um, ambition in the sense, in a different sense than necessarily making it into some elite hall of power. Uh, but in the, it's not just settling for, or, um, you know, not believing in yourself or I'm, I'm kind of uh, walking away from the opportunities that I have available to me in Manhattan. But actually, there are uh, possibilities inherent within this smaller and perhaps less um, known or noticed, but to uh, actually, yeah, the potential for a meaningful and purposeful life in a small town, um, especially for someone who's gone away and come back to it, I think are, are pretty um, 
important to pay attention to. So that's just a great, I don't know, for me, that was a great example of uh, humility, but not yeah. pusillanimity. Um, right. In, Listen in, to in you. Our, I know. You I, think I, the I like time's new, best. <laughs> my new vocabulary words. Um, well, as we come to a close, I thought maybe we could revisit those questions which you've referenced. And in the opening essay in the book, you um, list them out there. But um, in terms of this project and just, you know, for you personally, were there any particular things you learned in looking back to the past where you were like, ah, I, this helps me. Like, I didn't know that before. Was there anything from the past that you learned? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. This is my, my impoverished brain these days. Yes. I mean, and if you don't thing. have an answer to each of these, it's totally fine. I'm just curious in terms of thinking about your kind of past, present and future framing of it, whether there's anything you would hold on to for each of those, um, yeah. Yeah, moments. Well, as I did this project, one of our inspirations, um, it's not so far long ago, we, we did have some amazing pieces looking back at plagues that had hit in, in medieval times in the fourth century. And, and wow. um, those were, I think, just perspective lending, if nothing else. But um, I think in my role, trying to figure out what on earth I had seeded, <laughs> um, I part of well, a inspiration for the project wound up it being this thing called Oldham's Moot, which Susanna Black talks about in that closing mm-hmm. essay. But it was kind of a series, it was a group of Christians who in the 1930s in the UK and then throughout Europe were really wrestling with, and you know, the, the gathering steam of another world war, uh, a sense of a very atrophied and weakened church that didn't seem to be able to stand up to claims of racial superiority or nationalism. Mm-hmm. And so I have just over the project and ongoing, actually, I've just been reading, you have to kind of find these used, very extinct volumes, but sort of these kinds of lectures from these conferences that were held. And they became basically groups of friends meeting together in pubs, not unlike the Inklings, over that time through the 40s. And they kind of narrowed their purpose instead of uh, how does the church deal with the state and the community and society? It, they wound up really focusing on formation, like virtue formation of the next generation. And I think that was very worthy, um, although maybe not as structurally large. So I would just say what's striking when you read these lectures from people like Reinhold Niebuhr and Malcolm Muggeridge and that you, there's like, um, there is a, you're, you become aware that all of the things that we are dealing with today as pathologies, like, um, sort of like, what's, what's a phrase, like spiritual enemy, like the, um, there's a, there was a classical word I'm looking for, uh, it'll come to me, it starts with an A, um, <laughs> like the sort of the lack of connection between people, a deep, you know, a lot of the, the this sort of crisis of solidarity, et cetera, um, and then how people of Christian faith intersect with this and the weaknesses within and the quote enemies within, like it's all, nothing's really changed. Like we have technology, we have technology and things that have accelerated some of these same problems, but there's, I think what I've realized is there's something in modernity itself. Um, this is a longer conversation with someone smarter and more historically well-versed than me that, um, has led to this feeling of a breaking point that I feel every day, um, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but I think as an American right now, I feel we're in like a very precarious moment. Um, and so it's, I think I feel both like, oh, nothing's new under the sun. And some of what was building a hundred years ago, 80 years ago have just are the same and have just intensified. And, and we have, we being anyone who feels that sense of moral agency somehow haven't figured out a way to, I don't know if we're not looking at the right pain points. We haven't figured out a way to overcome them. Yeah. Well, and that maybe brings um, where I am curious. And I know you've already said that you felt like Breaking Ground wasn't able to do this um, as robustly as you would have wanted. But as you imagine a future together uh, in that opening essay, you ask, um, this is just quoting you, what might be born anew in this time and how might God's people help in the building? And I'm curious if you have any answers or beginnings of answers to that question of what might be born anew and how God's people might be a part of that? I don't have a large answer to that still. Um, I feel very small before that question. I do. And I'll just speak again. This is um, kind of in the proper noun of breaking ground. 
it's becoming a sort of ecosystem, a new ecosystem, like a real irrigation system in some ways of Mm -hmm. institutions that are diverse. Like they produce different, some are seminaries, some are universities, some are think tanks, some work with the poor in cities all around the world. Um, Some are Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, uh, others who represent publications that are concerned about classical liberalism, holding all these, there's, um, there's kind of this unique, this chase and remnant, but represented by civil society institutions that value the market and they value politics and the individual, but they are, they're, they're, those three things do not dominate. There's like this intersecting, like thick uh, set of formative institutions that have like, that now are kind of part of this canopy called breaking ground that is trying to figure out a way to sow a more robust and visible, like humanizing sphere um, that yes, is not going to be shy about the fact, or is not going to hide the fact that, or, or I should just say is inspired in part by, um, well, I'll just be very Christian here. Like Christ is like the ultimate measure of what it means to be human. Yeah. Um, but that is like trying to create this middle space or just more enchanted space in public dialogue in the academy, um, but is ultimately looking to like local practitioners who are finding a way to live out um, this humanism that is sort of rejecting like technocratic understandings of the human being mm-hmm. and then other understandings that are um, ultimately dehumanizing. So that's very broad, but there's an element where I do feel there's something that this project, this project has been able to bear, to bear witness to and to birth mm. that is kind of a new set of relationships and, and future collaborations, maybe more projects like this one, um, where those, we, where we care deeply about the common good and our need need all of our different disciplines, all of our different superpowers as organizations and all of our different weaknesses to um, somehow be in conversation around tables and um, creating a different kind of voice uh, that who knows what could impact down the road. But um, that was very broad. You can hear me. I'm still in the <laughs> No, I agree. And I unknown, think, but, it's, but it's there's seeds percolating. Like even in that essay about um, Oldham, Oldham's moot, is that right? Like that, yes. um, yeah. uh, there was a comment there about how people see, can look back and say that they failed because they didn't build more that was concrete. And yet we've inherited the way that they thought about the world. And so I think I hear a bit of that here too, where um, there is not a project to build a center for such and such in such and such a place, you know, and yet these webs of relationships actually um, are meaningful and substantive and will affect the future, uh, not only in terms of what actually happens, but also how we think. And I do think the way we think about what it means to be human and what it means to be in relation to one another is pretty integral to what our future holds. So I think that all makes a lot of sense. Um, if people want, obviously, uh, people want the book Breaking Ground, you can find it. Um, but is what else would, where else would you point anyone who's listening and just kind of wants to know more about this project? Yeah, um, the easiest way, I mean, the book is the clearest, most substantive way to get a window into the tone and um, like, intellectual tenor of of the project but if you go to breakingground.us that's sort of um an art a living archive of everything we produce and there you'll there's more events there's a little bit more of a feel of praxis there um and and some vision statements that sort of show what what inspired it where um and then i would just say uh we're figuring this out as we go. A part of it, you know, Breaking Ground is trying not to be a whole new organization. It's just trying to create some connective tissue at this point between, like I said, these sort of kindred spirited organizations that, you know, are, are also different um, from one another. And and I think, uh, you know, comment is we're creating um, a space on our website that references this sort of budding learning community. And for now, it's probably going to continue to be somewhat of a, of a, private sustenance between these organizational leaders, but I would not be surprised at all if in the next year or two, there's like another hello world. This is now what Breaking Ground is doing and creating. Would you be a part of it? So the best way is just to go to breakingground.us and that'll give a fuller flavor of the, of the project as it, as it existed during um, 2020 to 2021. 
Well, thank you, Anne, for the work you're doing and for sharing all of those thoughts and ideas with us and blessings to you as you continue to do this work. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to Love is Stronger Than Fear. Do remember to check out the show notes. You'll find out how you can win a copy of Breaking Ground. And if you would like to join my launch team for my upcoming book, To Be Made Well, you can check the show notes for how to be a part of that. And as always, I would love for you to share this episode, subscribe to this podcast, take the, I don't know, one minute to give a quick rating or review wherever you find your podcast. It would be such a help. I'm always thankful to Jake Hansen for editing and Amber Beery for doing everything behind the scenes to make this uh, podcast happen in the way that it does. And I'm thankful to you for being here. As you go into your day to day, I hope and pray that you will carry with you the peace that comes from believing that love is stronger than fear.